Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Stuart DeCue. I'm the program director at the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. Uh, and it's my pleasure today, um, for a number of reasons, uh, to welcome Chris Rogers. Um, first off, uh, because this is uh, Alumni Weekend at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. And Chris is an alum of the school uh, of 91, uh, Master's of Forest Science, and his career and work really, I think, exemplifies the sort of changing nature and arc of the school, is that, uh, you know, someone coming from a forestry background is now uh, designing the world's greenest uh, commercial office building or, you know, putting it together, making that deal work, developing it, uh, is really a testament to sort of how one can take your education, continue to learn, adapt, and grow, uh, and, you know, come out with a different uh, product at the end. Uh, this is a, a joint um, talk between the Sabin Environmental Venture Prize and the Blueprint for Efficiency Speaker Series. And welcome to everyone in our online audience. Uh, typically, um, those who follow us in the Blueprint Series, we host webinars. This is our, our first webcast. So we hope you enjoy it, giving you more of a live feed uh, and a view uh, from Yale and the conversation from here by one of the speakers that we bring in. Uh, a little bit about the Sabin Environmental Venture Prize as well. This is a, uh, a prize that we offer on a yearly basis uh, to the, the best student um, faculty or staff venture coming out of Yale that focuses on both um, an economic and environmental return. Uh, so really, how do we create businesses which solve multiple issues? Uh, and this process will go out throughout the year. Um, you can go to the CBA website and find out more information about it uh, for support on, on fall seed stage grants to sort of help seed these ideas and businesses and these innovations, the kind of which you know, Chris really exemplifies. Uh, and, the, uh, and then in the spring, the business planning competition for that $25,000 prize. Um, again, to the audience in Blueprint, welcome. We're excited to have you. Um, so I'm just going to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Chris Rogers is the CEO and founding partner of Point32, a Seattle-based real estate company committed to environmental performance through strong partnerships, quality design, and construction. Projects include award-winning Art Stable, the Bullet Center, and McGribler Place, uh, Place Park, uh, the Belroy Apartments on Capitol Hill, uh, the Bethaday Community Learning Space for Technology Access Foundation. Uh, Chris was formerly the Director of Capital Projects and Government Affairs at the Seattle Art Museum, where he oversaw the development of the Olympic Sculpture, uh, Sculpture Park. Previously, he created and protected urban parks and landscapes from Alaska to Puerto Rico for the Trust for Public Land, including the creation of a 14-mile stream valley park through the city of Baltimore. Chris has served on numerous nonprofit boards and is currently a member of the Seattle Parks Foundation, Ad Seattle Parks Foundation Advisory Council and the Pacific Northwest uh, design journal Arcade. A Seattle native, Chris has an undergraduate degree in art history from Bowdoin College and a master's in forestry from Yale University. And today we're going to hear about the Bullet Center, the world's greenest commercial office building. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here and it's nice to be back in New Haven. I'm not used to the humidity, especially running up the hill, but uh, it does feel good. Um, so you heard a little bit about um, Point 32, and maybe just to offer um, a little bit more background, when I left the Seattle Art Museum after finishing that big project, I uh, wanted to sort of test my hand in the private sector, and um, obviously 2007 was a really terrible time uh, to get into real estate, but we set out to really differentiate ourselves even in a declining market, so focusing on small urban infill projects, this first one here, the Art Stable, uh, just won a National AIA Award. It's a six-unit condominium building. It was the only project financed in a two-year period in uh, Washington State, residential condo building, and that's because we were able to pre-sell uh, four of those six units before we broke ground, um, a pretty unique structure. We set out to have an impact on the city's uh, physical development, but also thinking about its social infrastructure. Um, so a large body of our work is working with nonprofits. This project here for the Technology Access Foundation, which is an educational nonprofit, um, had been stalled for five years, and we broke the financing logjam by utilizing something called new market tax credits and RZFBs, which are recovery zone facility bonds that were made available through the federal government. Um, we've also done some historic rehab. You're seeing the contemporary portion of an apartment project um, in Seattle, uh, which is adjoining a 1931 Art Deco building. 
we actually took that building through the landmarks process and working with the neighborhood um, went after something called a contract rezone, which allowed us to reorganize the massing on the site and change the zoning, which hadn't been done in this residential neighborhood before. It was very risky, complex, um, very expensive, but we succeeded. Um, and we really were able to, in that process, show that sometimes prescriptive zoning is not the best thing that one should follow. And I think the result of that um, proves that point. We've also uh, been doing some planning. There's an organization, a uh, art school in Seattle, that has had a really tough time developing uh, its property. They've had a couple of failed visions, and so we wrote a plan with some funding from the Paul Allen Foundation to sort of rethink how they were um, thinking of growth and focusing much more on an incremental approach. Um, but it was really uh, the Bullet Center, uh, a project that we were most excited about uh, when we first started, so in that first year, Dennis Hayes, who's president of the foundation, approached my colleagues and I to see if we would be interested. And to be honest, we had no idea that we could pull something like this off, but um, we were hungry, we weren't making money, and so we said, yes, we could do it. And uh, so together, we embarked on this project, which was really to change the nature of green building. So what resulted is a 50,000 square foot uh, commercial office building not far from downtown Seattle, that houses the foundation and a number of other um, companies and nonprofits. So you can see the building here with that large solar array um, and then the, the six stories. Um, Bullet was interested in this project. Uh, the foundation has always been about leverage for many years. They focused on wildlife pre preservation, um, ecology kind of of natural areas and, and restoration. Um, of kind of rural places, but they've decided to focus more on cities, just given uh, the changing nature of cities around the world, but particularly um, in the Northwest, uh, which is their area of influence. And thinking about the growth, um, we're a small city today, but we're projected to uh, grow pretty significantly, and there just isn't the infrastructure to support the projected population. Um, when you think about buildings today, how much energy they use, uh, where that energy comes from, what they're emitting back uh, into the atmosphere, and the fact that most of our buildings, um, particularly contemporary buildings, are essentially disposable. They're built for a very short period of time. When you think about old loft buildings that have been repurposed sort of uh, decade after decade, uh, we've sort of lost that ability um, with new construction. So they wanted to change that as well, or at least look at that problem. And then obviously just the waste that's produced in the construction, in the demolition, but also in the operation of buildings. So what Dennis Hayes and the Foundation wanted to do through this project was to kind of um, rethink uh, the way we might approach green buildings. And I'm sure all of you have experienced walking into a, a building that is touting its greenness, but you're overwhelmed by the off-gassing. And it seems uh, not to be uh, sort of in line um, with the goals or, or sort of the stated uh, um, aspirations. So we wanted to kind of uh, take a look at, at the performance aspect of building, the process of creation, but also um, what it takes to sort of meet performance standards year after year. We also wanted to test the efficacy of solar power in the Northwest. The feeling is if we could do it in Seattle, we could do it almost anywhere uh, in the United States and to use the process to identify those barriers um, in land use codes and health codes that are preventing people from reaching higher levels of sustainability, and then also to grow uh, that knowledge base um, within the architects, designers, engineers um, within the Northwest, um, so supporting the local economy, and then making sure that we had a project that uh, we could uh, share information with others. So. We set out to pursue the Living Building Challenge. You may be familiar with it. It's um, a, a green building standard that was actually developed by Jason McLennan, uh, who is in Seattle, Washington, and used to head the um, Pacific Northwest and, uh, and Canadian chapter, sorry, Pacific Northwest chapter of the US and Canadian Green Building Council. They've since gone on to form the International Living Futures Institute, which oversees this program. Again, it's a performance-based standard. There are a number of imperatives or pedals that you have to achieve to be living building compliant. Um, in the past, there have been a number of buildings that have been certified, but they're small, one-story buildings, 
often in suburban or rural places that have a lot of land uh, to work with. And so we really wanted to see if it was possible to do this for a, an office building in a dense urban environment. And so just to, um, what I'm gonna do is just focus on some of those pedals and tell you a little bit about the process and, and where we've arrived. So the first thing was to help the foundation find a site and they wanted to choose um, a location that was close to downtown that was highly accessible, uh, particularly uh, by public transportation, but also was close to schools and universities, close to residential populations, and certainly um, to the office market as well. They also wanted to have a role in the economic development of a particular neighborhood. So our location, although sort of on the edge of Capitol Hill, which is kind of a booming neighborhood, uh, the one adjacent to it, the central area, has not seen a lot of, uh, a lot of development. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, meeting net zero energy, which is the, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that we had. So the Living Building Challenge says that you have to produce all of the energy on site that you're going to use um, on an annual basis. And as I mentioned, we couldn't be in a worse spot um, for solar power. It's gray a lot of the time in the Northwest. Um, but we ended up creating a building with a 244 KW rated array that will produce about 233,000 kilowatt hours in our climate. Um, to get to net zero, um, we looked at obviously what's called the EUI, the Energy Use Index, and it's similar to you know, the miles per gallon rating system that you see with motor vehicles. So if you look there on the left, a typical office building um, you know, built today may have an EUI of 92. Um, to reduce that, uh, you can see here, this is actually a pretty um, detailed list. We focused really on the building systems first. So uh, thinking about the building skin, thinking about the, the energy systems, um, thinking about the building operations. Um, from there, to get to 32, we really looked at lighting, how to maximize daylighting within the space uh, to control the use of lighting within the building. So 32, a building that has an EUI of 32 is equivalent to a lead building that is meeting all of its uh, energy credits. But we had to drive it much further than that, given that our array could only produce um, an EUI of 16. So the next step was really to think about uh, the tenants and what we could do to change behaviors in the building um, to reduce the amount of energy that people would use on a, a daily basis. And so if you look here at this slide, this is comparing a building with a 92, 92 EUI versus ours and if you look here at the heating and cooling represents 35% of the energy that a building with a 92 EUI might use. Um, and for us, uh, we get down to something much lower than that. So we're at, at 5%. So what that does, it preserves a majority of the building's energy or roughly 50% of it uh, to give to the tenants for their daily operations. So in that sense, we're able to compete as class A office space in the market because there are no compromises. So even though people coming into the building um, have, sorry, um, sort of a role in how well the building performs, we can guarantee them that they're going to be able to function in the same way that they would in a, a building downtown. Um, this is just kind of for kicks here. If you think about uh, the solar array on our building, if we had built our building to um, an EUI of 83, our solar array would have to be this big. And you can see that shrinking, and this is where we end up. So although it is a prominent building feature, um, it could have been much larger if we were uh, operating in a more typical fashion. Um, in terms of daylight optimization, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but um, what's interesting here is that this is the property boundary. You can see the dashed line on the slide. So a typical developer would want to maximize its FAR, its floor area ratio under land use code, so building out to the edges. But because we were thinking about performance, we had to narrow our floor plates. So um, we had a site that's roughly 100 by 100. Uh, this is a span of roughly 30 feet here. So with glazing on all sides, you know, the core in the middle, um, we're able to ensure that daylight is reaching all of those occupied spaces. And you can see that in the slide here. Our floor to floor heights are roughly 13 feet. Um, so you can see just the kind of ample glazing here. Uh, and the limited overhead lighting. 
Um, on the outside of the building, we have these operable shades, so literally Venetian blinds that respond um, to the solar conditions. So in a typical building that might have a great view, the sun comes out, you have to close the, the shade so you can actually see, and then the lights come on. Um, so obviously not an efficient way to design a space. So by putting them outside of the building, we're able to control that glare. And if you look on the left, here's a kind of typical office condition where you don't have that glare control and you can see those hot spots that uh, penetrate the interior. And when you compare that on the right, you can see how those blinds essentially keep that glare out of the building so that we can maintain lighting conditions inside without relying on additional energy to do that. Um, the tenants are very much aware um, and have to sign on to green leases um, and stay within a certain amount of allocated energy use floor by floor. Um, so we have this wonderful dashboard that people can log into, the public can come into the building and visit. Um, and most of the workstations are you know, monitored here through this plug strip. So uh, if we recognize that someone seems to be using a lot more energy, we can go to that workstation and unplug that hair dryer or whatever it is they've got um, under their desk. So you can see here just um, over the course of, I can't see the date down there, but um, I guess the last 30 days, um, you can see the green line is how much energy we're producing as the you know, sun uh, has changed uh, over the course of that 30 day period in Seattle. But here's the constant energy use uh, with the building and we're about 80% occupied now. Um, we are beating our um, estimates in terms of production and also in terms of use. So we're feeling pretty good about our ability to meet net zero because we know in the winter that that green line is going to uh, go down. So again, net zero energy, producing a lot in the summertime, sending it back to the city grid, and in the winter potentially borrowing um, to achieve that goal. In terms of uh, net zero water, also a really complicated um, aspect of the project and one that we haven't totally solved, um, but the requirement there is that you're also uh, collecting all of the water that the building needs on site and you're managing all of your waste on site. So um, instead of an underground garage, we built a 56,000 gallon cistern. We're capturing all of the rainwater that falls on the roof and storing it there. Um, as we need that water for potable purposes, it is uh, filtered here through a complex uh, series of filters, stored in a 500 gallon uh, tank, and then drawn up into the building. And then, you know, this refills on an annual basis as that water is needed. For our ability to um, capture rainwater for potable use, uh, it is now illegal in the state of Washington, and we are trying to change that. And the only way that we can change that is to actually set up a new water district. So meeting all of the standards that say a municipality like the city of Seattle has to, um, to go through to ensure that that drinking water is safe and all regulated by the um, Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, with respect to gray water, so water coming from sinks and showers, we are initially um, capturing that in the basement and then slowly feeding it up to a um, constructed wetland, uh, which is on the north side of our building. And once that is cleaned uh, to the point that the city and the state and the county, um, and we've agreed to, it is then infiltrated into the street right of way. So not unlike a, a drain field that you might find in a rural setting, but again, it hasn't been done in an urban context before. And you can see here the horsetails that are the plants that are actually Kind of doing the work and then this is the right of way in front of the building so all of these things required um, a lot of permission um, obviously meeting the cleanup requirements ensuring that any of our gray water was a safe distance from the water main that runs through the street um, but also our ability to use the public right of way for this purpose um, was something that uh, had to be approved and then uh, composting toilets, they're not new, but I think we're probably the first or second building to use them in a, uh, a multi-storied structure. So six stories of composting toilets, um, all going down into the basement. Uh, these are the units here. We will probably not have uh, composted fertilizer for another 12 to 18 months. Um, and then that will be sent to a, um, a restoration site 
working with King County. So just kind of to bracket what we're doing, people might say, well, you've got great municipal systems, you know, great sources of drinking water, um, great ways to manage um, sewage in the city. But again, as the population grows, and Seattle recently went through this, or the county rather, we had to build this large treatment facility. And the only land that could be found was far away um, from the coast from any potential um, outfall um, to you know, a huge cost. So any new construction project in the city is now financing this. Um, at some point, this will not be enough and they will have to build another one unless we can build um, other systems and smaller scale systems. So I'm not convinced yet that we should be doing this on an individual building basis, but there's probably some district um, level strategies that could be very beneficial. Um, in terms of meeting the healthy building materials uh, imperative, this was also uh, very, very challenging. Um, we know that um, our building products are a source of pollution in Puget Sound, which is our most famous body of water. Um, we know that killer whales now have the highest concentration of phthalates, um, or sorry, flame retardants of any um, animal on the planet. Um, we know some of the traditional sources of these things, but we're also learning um, essentially what the materials in our building products and the, the impact that they're having on human health and the environment. So looking at, at studies like this um, coming out of um, Scandinavia. Um, today, for example, we know that 0.1 parts per million of formaldehyde causes uh, respiratory, uh, negative respiratory impacts. And yet HUD has set a threshold that is much higher than that. And uh, if you remember after Hurricane Katrina, many of the people housed in that temporary housing suffered from respiratory illnesses because that threshold is much higher um, in those temporary structures. So, you know, people are suffering from the off-gassing. When we went after um, this list and this project, uh, the Living Building Challenge gave us 15 chemicals. And we thought, well, this is gonna be relatively easy. We'll just identify them and exclude them. It turns out that those 15 um, became a much larger list. It's easy if you're looking for formaldehyde um, using the material safety data sheet that accompanies every building product. But many of them are referenced by a name that I can barely pronounce. There are a lot of aliases within the industry. Um, so it was a very difficult thing for us to try and vet. But fortunately, each of those chemicals has something called a CAS number. So it's essentially the social security code. So we were able to construct a database and search and also realize that what we were looking for was 362 chemicals that had to be eliminated. So in our process, we vetted about 1,300 different building products. In a lot of cases, we just had to you know, eliminate um, products outright. And in other cases, we were able to work with manufacturers on new ways of uh, producing what it is that, that we needed. Um, also, within the Living Building Challenge, you um, are challenged to uh, reduce the environmental impact of material transport and production, um, and also as a way of supporting locally produced materials. So, for example, with our gypsum wallboard, we found a manufacturer in the Northwest, but realized that they were getting that parent material from southern Mexico, where we have no idea the standards under which that material is mined. So looking a little further, we were able to source that product in, um, in BC and uh, the raw materials coming from Alberta. So le leading to a, a reduced uh, transportation cost and impact. In terms of um, kind of working with this material challenge and, and some of the successes, um, one I'd love to talk about is a Prosoco Fast Flash, which is this liquid applied air barrier uh, which was essentially painted on the outside of the building. And when we were, uh, when the architects specified that product, um, we realized after doing our research that it contained known phthalates. And so we went to the manufacturer and said, you know, we can't use your product. And they said, fine, you know, we don't need to be in your building then. And about a month later, the guy called us back and said, you know what, if you would give us a little bit of time, we're going to see if we can reformulate our product and the phthalate is the uh, sort of plasticizer that you use to create flexibility in plastic. So, you know, PVC, for example, um, contains a lot of it. 
And so he tested his material, came back and said, I don't need to put this in my product anymore. We said, great, we'll buy it. And he has now gone on to exclude it from all of his uh, building materials. So that's a, a, a pretty exciting story. Um, looking at kind of the Northwest history, most of our buildings sort of pre-1920s were timber frame buildings. So we decided we wanted to pursue that as well. So using um, FSC wood, we erected the first sort of large scale uh, commercial building using timber frame construction, um, I think since 1926. We obviously have to use steel bracing to meet seismic code. There is a concrete core, but the majority of the building um, is this timber frame and it uh, nicely evokes the spirit of the Northwest as well and is a sustainably um, produced product. With respect to the windows, the window that we found that we wanted to use is manufactured in Germany by a company called Schuko. It's a triple glazed window but because Germany is so far away and outside of the distance radius requirements, um, we had to rethink how we were gonna take advantage of that. So we worked, I guess I'm doing that, I apologize. Um, so we worked with a local company called Goldfinch who actually accessed the Shuko technology under an agreement with them and is now manufacturing these windows in the Northwest. So they manufactured them for us. And it's a really phenomenal window. It may be hard to see here, but um, uh, they're large windows that actually open, you know, perpendicular to the, the building plane. So um, unlike a typical casement window that hinges on one side where you're going to get wear on that gasket and ultimately leaks, ours has kind of a, a consistent um, uh, kind of closing and, and, and opening so you don't get that, that breakdown. In terms of... Uh, Creating a, a healthy work environment, also an important goal of the challenge. Um, these are just a few interesting slides, but if you, and none of this is, is new material here, but if you look at obesity trends uh, in the US and how quickly our country is gaining weight, it's pretty shocking. I don't know if you can see the numbers at the base of the slide here, but we're now, you know, Washington State is about to pop up here. So now that our population, I'm, seeing in the color there, 25% of us is, is overweight. So what are the role that buildings can play in sort of a healthy lifestyle given how much time we spend in our work environments? Um, so one of the things that we did, which was also an energy saving move, was to figure out how to get people to move up and down using the stairs as opposed to immediately going to the elevator. So typically when you enter an office building, the elevator is the first thing that you see um, in this case, we allocated the best real estate to what we call this irresistible stair that offers these tremendous views um, out to the city in the Olympic Mountains and back to the Cascades. It's an unheated space. It does have operable windows for ventilation, um, but it's become uh, kind of a great success story and, and a really nice architectural feature as well. Um, and it also helped us mitigate, just to go back here, the grade change, which is roughly 10 feet um, from this point down here. So uh, the occupants of these lower two floors use this entry, whereas those climbing to the upper floors use this entry here. So we're saving them uh, two floors in that process. And then with respect to equity, sort of redesigning um, the interior so that everyone has access to the same conditions in terms of lighting, ventilation, and space. So you can see here, this is a, a typical floor plan that uh, most of the uh, tenants have followed in their build outs. Uh, workstations focused on the perimeter of the building and then the you know, conference rooms and kitchen, uh, the public and shared spaces are located in the core. So these are independently ventilated um, and lit uh, sort of on demand, whereas these are more um, sort of part of the overall building systems or, or managed by those systems. And here's a, a shot. This is actually of uh, 0.32's floor. So we decided we wanted to be in the building um, and obviously couldn't afford to take down roughly 8,000 square feet. We're just six people. So we set up a professional co-work. So we built the space out and are leasing uh, individual workstations to individuals or small companies. And that's been a great success for us. Um, in terms of some of the policy changes and, and uh, regulations that we had to um, push through. 
Um, the first one uh, related to demolition and salvage. So on the site was a one-story uh, wood-framed uh, restaurant and bar that had been there about 70 years. And under the uh, city land use code, you aren't allowed to remove a building until you have um, your building permits. And typically, by the time you've gotten your building permits, you know, time is money, and so developers want to move as quickly as possible. But we were able to change the code to say, look, if you can give us time, we know we're going to get the permit eventually. We'd like to take this building apart in pieces and salvage the materials that are reusable. So that is now possible in the city. Um, we also had to establish a new pilot program under the land use code called the Living Building Pilot. It's set up for uh, the first dozen projects to go through the, the permitting challenges within the city and then at the end of that to identify things that potentially could be permanent changes. So um, this gave us the ability, uh, for example, you can see here to increase the floor to floor heights of our structure. These buildings adjacent to us were built to um, the current height limit. This one is probably a little less than 65 feet, but that's what we were dealing with here. And you can see here, this is four stories, which is pretty typical um, in terms of floor to floor heights, but here's our four stories here. So we ended up narrowing the building, making it taller, and that was made possible through this um, pilot program. The PV array, um, for example, within the city, you were, obviously, you were allowed to use uh, photovoltaics, but they had to be set back from the building and could only occupy a certain percentage of the building roof because a lot of people feel that they're unattractive. But this pilot program allowed us to create um, essentially our, our energy source on site. Um, Car-free living is another imperative of the challenge. Um, I think this is particularly, particularly interesting in a city like Seattle, which is still, you know, in this growth process. But in the 2010 census in our neighborhood, we know that um, the car ownership ratio is only 0.4 per household, whereas citywide it's closer to one per household. So the demand for parking is just not there. More and more people are are just not choosing to drive or to own cars. Most developers and most banks um, won't finance projects without parking. They see that as a, a market risk. But we were able to convince our lenders that, um, that we would uh, create a, a viable um, investment and elected not to build a garage. It isn't an absolute requirement of the challenge that you do so but it was made possible through um, the urban village overlay. So many years ago, the city said, if your building is located within these um, certain areas, you don't have to build uh, parking for cars or you don't have to build them at the traditional ratios. And initially we thought, well, maybe we should um, provide a couple electric cars that can be shared by tenants, but there were so many zip cars and car to goes within the neighborhood that we didn't need to try to duplicate something that was already performing really well. So we did create a great garage for bikes and there are showers on every floor. I talked a little bit about the challenges uh, with potable water. Hopefully uh, within the next few months we'll have approval there to be able to drink our water. And then the same is true with uh, the composting toilets and the gray water. Um, we were able to, um, I showed you the image of the uh, the sewage treatment plant and mentioned that every new building has to sort of pay into a fund based on the number of plumbing units that you have within your structure. So we were able to get a code change that allowed us to be exempt from that program and instead invest that money into creating uh, these systems within our building. And currently the Bullet Foundation is working with some other partners in Seattle City Light to really think about how in, um, incentives are paid within the city. When we started our project, they were like, oh, great, we will give you a check for X because you are reaching lead platinum plus plus. And so we said, no, I think this should be much more of a performance-based system. And particularly for older buildings, it's a way for them to capture outside investment to make deep retrofits and then through those incentives pay back those investors. So um, everyone wins under this program that is uh, currently in development. Um, another aspect of the project, which I, I think is pretty unique and one that I'm very proud of, is oftentimes developers will just look at their site, but this client 
um, allowed us to sort of say, well, how do we use the private development process to leverage um, improvements in the surrounding neighborhood? So across from us was this little kind of forlorn green space that no one uses. There's nothing to do when you get there. It's hard for most people to climb up over this concrete wall. Um, and so we decided to take it on as a project. And it turns out that the two neighborhoods on either side of our building, the Central District and Capitol Hill, both talked about opportunities to transform these sort of leftover traffic islands as meaningful neighborhood gathering spots. Oops. So we actually uh, recently transformed that into the new McGilver Place Park. And what is maybe hard to see here is, uh, I don't know why that slide is not appearing, um, but this street in front of our building, we actually closed uh, to motor vehicle traffic. So borrowing some of the things that I learned uh, in courses here with Bill Birch, we set out to provide the real data to the Department of Transportation who said, no, you can't close the street. It gets a lot of use and we were able to say, no, it doesn't. And uh, here's how much use it gets. And so we actually engaged students from uh, a nearby Seattle University to come out and, and sort of document those patterns of use, but also filmed the misuse. And so it's hard to see here, this is a major arterial, but when you approach it, you're only allowed to turn right. And most of the cars moving through this intersection were going across it or turning to the left. So we were able to say to the department, we're actually helping you out too. We're minimizing the number of accidents that currently occur at this intersection. So they ultimately came on board. We got some funding from the city, raised some money privately, um, and transformed it into this new neighborhood park in front of the building. Um, and what's also exciting, it's the first landscape project that is pursuing uh, living building challenge status in the world. So um, we've just submitted all the paperwork on that, and it's now being audited. So we're awaiting the results. Um, in terms of the tenant mix, we designed the space, uh, the two lower floors, to house um, organizations and institutions focused on uh, green building research and education. So the University of Washington's uh, Integrated Design Lab, which is uh, part of the College of the Built Environments, shares space with the International Living Futures Institute, and together with Bullet, they're managing uh, the Urban Ecology Partnership, which occupies the lower floor. The first exhibition is focused on the creation of the Bullet Center, but the idea is that it can be used to um, make visible sort of the latest research um, in green building or urban sustainability. And we recognize that things that we've done here uh, will be exceeded by someone else, we hope, in a few years. So this can still be an active place for people to learn. Um, and then when you kind of move back into the um, sort of back of house spaces, we've designed them so that they're visible. There will ultimately be some QR codes associated with each of the elements of this mechanical system, for example, so visitors can come and learn about how the building uh, functions. We've had a lot of uh, dignitaries, visitors from overseas. We've been invited to speak uh, in many spots around the country and the world. I think there is um, great interest in this project and one of our goals uh, from the beginning was to, to share everything that we've learned. So as our data comes in on energy and water and everything else, that will be um, made available through the, the Bullet Center website. A lot of people talk about costs, and uh, we will hear often that only a wealthy foundation could afford to take something on like this. Um, and that's true initially, because a lot of the costs in this project are in the policy changes and in that upfront research. But again, if we can make that information available to others, those first costs go away with each subsequent project. And you think about LEED. I worked on a project uh, back in this period and the client decided not to pursue LEED because it was complex, cumbersome, time consuming and costly. But we now know obviously the, the rate of absorption is quite high. And I wish I had a map that showed the number of living building challenge uh, projects that are now happening around the world. Um, but it's uh, quite astounding from just a few years ago where there were just a few of us out there. So with that, I'd be happy to answer questions or listen to your comments. Yes. Hi. <laughs> 
Uh, my name is Sheena Zhang, and I'm a joint degree student with the School of Forestry and the School of Architecture. Okay. Um, and I actually have two questions. The first one is about the uh, sun shading system on the outside of the building, and you mentioned that they were essentially Venetian blinds, and I was hoping you could talk about why they're on the outside instead of the inside, if like weather resistance or durability is an issue. And then secondly, um, my other question is how, to what extent has um, the branding of the Living Building Challenge either helped you or um, been a detriment? For example, you mentioned um, the company that was able to take out the phthalates from um, the air insulation right. uh, material. And was that, do you think they changed their mind on that because they were excited about being affiliated with the Living Building Challenge or what are your thoughts on that? And if you ran into any obstacles because people were, like contractors were afraid of sort of taking on this new thing that they weren't familiar with. Yeah, great question. So the first in terms of the, the shading system. So if they were on the interior of the building, they would do nothing to keep that you know solar heat gain um, from entering. So if they're on the outside, we're blocking it before it can come in. So it's controlling both heat gain, but also the glare. Um, and in terms of durability, yes, there have been a few days where I'm sitting at my desk and the wind picks up and they start shaking, but they are supposed to retract when the wind exceeds a, a certain speed. So they're responsive to what's happening outside, but all of this is taking some adjustment. So initially we had a couple of them break, but they've now been fixed and I think it's operating well. Um, in terms of the living building challenge, I think uh, any sort of performance-based standard is good. And I know with some other projects that we're working on, we've got clients who are interested in aspects of the challenge, but not all of them. So, um, you know, is it important for us? Yes and no. I think it's more important to educate people on the kind of importance of performance-based design. Um, and energy efficiency and water conservation and good material sourcing. Um, in terms of the, the contractors, I think uh, the one manufacturer of that liquid applied air barrier um, potentially saw phthalates as the next asbestos issue and so decided that he didn't want to get obviously caught up um, in you know lawsuits and all of the other ills that come out of knowledge that we've gained. Um, and we had some contractors, uh, we had lots of sort of education going on on site. Um, and one of our uh, project managers actually was on site every day and had to check the products that were coming. And, you know, when you're in the construction process, sometimes you run out of things. And so you run to the hardware store. And, you know, that happens on even buildings of our scale. And so a few times we had to say, no, you can't use that spray foam insulation, you know, to fill that hole. So. Yes, we have a we have a question from our online audience. Okay. Uh, Gabriel Gabriel Grant asks: This sounds like a tremendous amount of work. Did people put in off the clock or unbillable hours? And how did that compare to a typical project? Hi, Gabriel. I think he's uh, dialing in from Seattle. Um, so, yes, it took a lot of work and. Um, I'm not sure it took more work than, well, it did take more work. I mean, there was a, a lot sort of on the research side and on the policy side. So typically, you know, when you're doing a capital project, you kind of, um, you know, there's uncertainty kind of in the permitting, there's uncertainty around kind of the, the infrastructure pieces. But once you move into construction, it's, it's pretty carefully mapped out. But in our case, some of those other things just extended throughout the life of the project. So yes, more work, not necessarily, um, a huge amount more hours for anyone individually, just more people working on different aspects. Yes. Hi, uh, Theo Poland uh, from the School of Management. Um, so, I mean, recognizing you could probably spend an hour talking about the financing for this. Yes, um, I mean, can you you're asking the wrong person. Uh, but yeah. can you briefly speak to um, sort of the overall cost compared to a, you know, a comparable size class A office building and maybe some of the Sure. Save, savings from operation? Yeah, so um, at this point, and we are going to be kind of putting out all of that financial data after we've um, analyzed it a little bit more. Some of the investments are, um, 
you know, investments that the foundation made and would make as a, a philanthropy. And so we're trying to figure out whether those should be separated from the building project. And it's really hard to compare, you know, projects as apples to apples because some people throw the land costs in and some people don't. But I would say at this point, um, we are probably looking at a 20% cost overage. Um, and again, that includes a lot of that research and policy work. The building was financed. We did use uh, new market tax credits given our location. So that brought down the cost of borrowing. We did use um, um, some other sources as well, but we then used a, a conventional uh, construction loan. And so the, the foundation, um, they see this as an investment. So they are making money off this project or they will someday over time. It may not be the rate of return that a typical office developer might seek, um, but they are um, you know, wisely trying to invest their resources and they've got you know, those investments distributed. They've been in real estate in the past, so they're back in it just with a different kind of project. Yes. Uh, Simon Gore, MEM. Uh, I had a question about um, concept and schematic design with your engineers and architects. Uh, like what kind of initial energy models you guys might have, they might have proposed to you and then how you establish later on like feeding data back to them if there's an ongoing relationship in order to sort of accurately project the assumptions they made. Right. It's a, um, a really good question, and I didn't talk a lot about the design process. You've heard about the integrated design process. Obviously, it becomes really important in a building like this. You know, you're concerned about um, a design being able to accommodate your desired program and making sure the aesthetics are hitting the bar that you're after, but now you're laying on this performance requirement. So as important to the architect was our mechanical engineer um, and a firm that is based in Portland, but now has an office in the Bullet Center, PAE did all of that early modeling. Um, we did pursue an early scheme, an atrium scheme, but we determined that um, we couldn't hit the daylighting that we needed to to get to the 16 EUI. So I think we were back in the 24, 28 range. So we had to abandon that scheme. So back to cost, that was an effort that a typical project might not have to absorb. So. Yes. Can you talk, um, Truman Mack, first, second year Masters of Environmental Management, can you talk more about uh, what kind of additional steps you guys had to take to let, um, for the city to let you guys have those solar panels overhang on public spaces? Um, that's a great question. There is uh, something in Seattle called uh, a Skybridge permit. and. Anything that encroaches into the public rights of way has to go through that process. So it's reviewed by the Seattle Design Commission and then ultimately approved by the um, city council. And there's public review of those encroachments. Um, in this process, you're typically charged um, by the degree of impact. So when I did the Olympic Sculpture Park project, we had some pedestrian bridges crossing roadways. We were charged a different rate than we were for the photovoltaic arrays. And we were able to um, help the city come up with a new system that would um, essentially charge sustainable features like this a lot less if they weren't having an impact on mobility. So, um, but now we're subject to a term permit. I think we've got two 25-year uh, terms on that array. Um, you may have noticed the structure sort of floats above the building. So the idea is that over time, as panels become more efficient, we could actually switch it out to something that maybe shaped differently, maybe smaller, who knows. Or we take advantage of that space and send that, you know, create more energy for others. Yes. Uh, my name is Ben Butterworth. I'm a uh, second year at the uh, Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Um, I just had a question regarding uh, parking logistics. Um, you know, what percent of the people currently working in the Bullet Center drive to work? Where are they parking? Um, is there any information on average commuting distance? And are you worried about uh, future concerns about renting the office space given the lack of parking? Um, great questions. And we had certainly a lot of neighbors who were concerned that uh, the impact of this new building without parking was going to impact their ability to park. But there are residential parking zones within the city. They just haven't been um, set up for this neighborhood yet. 
which really has nothing to do with us. But um, I would say that the majority of people coming to the building are not arriving by car. And if they are, they're finding spots in the neighborhood or they're using pay lots or they're renting a space in one of the apartment buildings, um, you know, within the, the neighborhood. I know in, in my office, um, there are six of us and three of us have sold our cars since moving into the building. So we're now using bikes, walking, uh, car share program. So um, some of the tenants, uh, it's interesting, you have that conversation with them and um, I've been involved in some of those discussions and they'll say, oh, how am I, where are my employees going to park? And then you ask them where are they located now and are their employees driving to work? And they say, no, actually they're taking the bus. So it really isn't that different. It just, it's whether or not this location works for them. Yes. Uh, my name is Eric Plunkett, a uh, joint degree with the School of Forestry and the School of Management. Um, it seems like a lot of things came together perfectly for this project that, that aren't um, uh, going to be part of a typical development process. So which of these lessons learned are actually scalable? Well, um, you're just seeing it at the end. It was by no means a perfect process. Complicated, uh, lengthy, and difficult. More so, so then. Right. Well, I think, uh, you know, initially Bullet wanted to um, test this on a building of this size. You know, the majority of urban structures are, you know, roughly 25 to 50,000 square feet. So if we could create uh, a building that um, performed this well, uh, you know, yes, it could be adopted elsewhere. So I think, you know, everything we've learned about materials can be shared with other projects. Obviously, you know, using solar energy. If we can, I said, do it in Seattle, you can do it in most other places. The water is probably a more challenging thing, just depending on where you are. So, yes. Hi, my name is Rashan. I'm from uh, the architecture school as well as um, School of Forestry. And I'm really interested in um, beauty being an aspect or one of the principles of the Living Building Challenge. And I'm just wondering how much impact that had on the appearance of the building and whether sort of it was a result of the other principles or if that was the element in itself that you were designing for? It's a, a really good question. And um, when we uh, selected our architect, we went through a rigorous selection process. So Miller Hull Partnership based in Seattle with the architects of the project. And we interviewed probably, oh, 15 firms between Vancouver and Portland. Um, we wanted to work with someone who was locally based just for ease of access. Um, but I would say that Miller Hull has been um, well regarded for their design aesthetics and um, we're pretty happy with the result and have already received, you know, recognition. So, um, and it's an important aspect of, of the Living Building Challenge as well. I mean, obviously everyone has different ideas about what's uh, beautiful, um, but I think the building fits in really nicely with the neighborhood. And it's interesting if you look back to, or think back to some of the slides where you see our project next to the adjacent apartment building and you know that PV array is such a substantial design element, significant element. But you look at other buildings that don't have anything sort of at the top, they look incomplete in a way. So it's kind of a, a funny relationship that's been set up now. And I think many people have responded to that. Yes. So uh, Anthony Clark, a joint degree student between the School of Forestry and School of Management. Um, I'm wondering, in thinking about the greatest sources of uncertainty for the performance of the building, I think oftentimes when we're looking at green buildings uh, after they're built, we find that it's usage <laughs> and it's occupants that actually can be the largest drivers there. So I'm wondering if that was true in the project planning for the Bullet Center, and if so, um, you know, what were the things that you learned for how to better contain that. I mean, I was interested to see the really great monitoring of plug load. So right. you're obviously l looking more closely at what's happening, but were there other insights? Um, is there a maximum building size, for example, that really helps work? Or what other aspects of actually interacting with the, the well, tenants? Yeah, no, it, it's a really good question. And, you know, we've just, we moved in essentially on Earth Day of this year. So we have not been in the building that long. We still have one floor left to lease. Um, and there is a, a green lease that sort of guides occupants' behavior. And I would say the people who've elected to be in the building, you know, they're a self-selecting group. And they range from the 
engineering firm I mentioned occupies half a floor to a, a new technology company that wants to be on the, you know, the cusp of innovation. So they wanted a space that would communicate those values. Um, so I think everyone is very aware of the standards. Sometimes it breaks down at the individual level, you know, and you, certain activities you observe um, you want to uh, adjust, you know, people trying to use the elevator, for example, when they probably shouldn't. Um, but nothing has been major at this point. So I don't know if that gets at your question, but yeah. I mean, yeah, no, and one other thought is that um, we modeled essentially that each floor uh, could have roughly 42 people working, you know, nine to five. And given, at least on our floor, sort of the performance um, uh, that we're monitoring now, we're doing pretty well. So could we actually add more people to our floor? I mean, that's something that we'll be able to know in a year or so. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from the online audience. Uh, Michael Balliger asks, um, and uh, I think there are related questions here in the audience as well. Uh, in New York City, the coverage of rooftop solar arrays is limited in order to preserve access by firefighters. Was this an issue for the Bullet Center? So within that overhang, uh, what are the policy issues that you had to overcome, and were, or were there any? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we actually had to elevate the array, I think, seven feet above the building skin, the roof, um, so that there would be access for firefighters. A related question, I'm Stuart DeCue, the program director at the Yale Center for Business and the Environment um, and a graduate of the School of Management and the School of Forestry. What, what was the most surprising thing that you learned about the way conventional buildings were built going through this challenge? Is there something that sticks out in your mind throughout this entire process, which you described as you know, quite challenging, that yeah. just, just sort of is the, a takeaway that you sort of always pops to the top of your mind? Well, in the... Um in the process of construction, I was struck by how beautiful the building was when it was going up. And typically, you know, buildings um, don't sort of, uh, you know, put off their, their final performance until they're completely done. Everything is snapped together. But seeing this timber frame construction, I mean, it just was kind of this, you know, jaw-dropping thing to witness in the city. Um, so I would say for me, that was a, a really kind of significant takeaway was that, that process. And, and the building is designed so that, for example, the skin, which is a, you know, recycled, uh, metal product, you know, after a certain number of years that will need to be replaced. The windows might need to be upgraded, but that structure is built to last, you know, 250 years. So everything has its own kind of shelf life. One more question. Um, my name's Owen. I'm not affiliated with Yale, but I'm an architect uh, working on a net zero energy building out in Bethany. Um, I'm just wondering, has it been a success from a development perspective? You've had to compromise on the footprint and um, Yes, and I'm. we're not an owner in the project, so um, we were functioning as the owner's representative to the Bullet Foundation. So we were paid for our services. But I think the foundation, um, as I mentioned, they are projecting a return. It's probably not what a typical developer would, would want to make, but um, they're not solely in the business of, of making money. You know, they, they're there to manage their investments, but also to do good work. So, um, so yes, I think the clients that, or the tenants rather, that are in the building are, are very happy in the space. And I think it's, it's working very well. And um, we also, you know, the building is one of the first commercial buildings in this neighborhood, one of the first office buildings. So it's dominated by uh, residential buildings and, you know, restaurants and bars. And we were interested in helping it evolve to a more kind of 24-hour neighborhood. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you.